So I'm going to challenge you with that from the get-go. I want to challenge you to, when you hear something, when something resonates, dive in a little bit deeper. If you want additional resources, I might know of a few books. I like books, and I cannot lie. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> what I want you to understand is, like, we are here to help you in your faith journey in every part, in every way, right? Including, intellectually, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our all of our mind, that means we don't check our brains at the door. Okay, So we're going to dive into this, and we're going to be looking at a lot of objective data, because I believe data is important. That tells a story. The book of Acts is about the church. It's about the starting of the church, how the church got started. And I'll tell you, I, I hear a lot of questions uh, out at the Green Tent and beyond when people after a service will ask me things that they've always wanted to ask, and I'm out there after every service, and a little bit of a captive audience, if you will, and so they bring a question, and maybe they've never felt free to ask it, but in this place, you're free to ask questions. That's a good thing, and so people will bring questions, and, and one of those questions that I hear most often is, what is this church thing all about, and why do we really care? They don't often say the second part. That's implied, but this is the question of really, our day and every day for the last 2,000 years. What, what's the church about? What's, what's it about, and why do we care? Does it really matter? Does it make a difference? If this church were to disappear tomorrow, if we stopped meeting and this church disappeared, would anyone notice and would anyone care? I hope so. But we have to be able to talk about this, and I think that's what the book of Acts does. It enables us to have a conversation about the church from its very earliest days. What does it mean to be the church? Why does the church matter? What's the church for? What's the purpose? If you don't understand why something is supposed to be what it is, you'll never accomplish the purpose of it. It's like what we often say, if you don't know why it's working when it's working, you won't know how to fix it when it breaks. I want to know why the church is working. I want to know why things are the way they are. I want to know what the purpose is. I want to understand the why. And Acts is about the why. I love how N.T. Wright, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, talks about Acts. He says this, he says, Acts is full of the energy and the excitement of the early Christians as they found God doing new things all over the place. It's also full of the puzzles and problems that churches faced then and today. Crises over leadership, money, ethnic divisions, theology and ethics, and clashes with political and religious authorities. Now I realize we don't really care or talk about any of these things because they really don't impact our daily lives, right? But imagine for just a second, if they did, they would also impact the church. And this is what we see in the book of Acts. And we're going to talk about every one of these things because every one of these things matters then and now. So, I want to dive into Acts. We're going to cover the first 11 verses today, hopefully. And if at the end, we may come back next week and do a little bit more. We'll see. I'm holding this series very loosely. I've got it planned out. Everything is planned. But plans are a framework. And I find there is great flexibility inside planning. So, this is where we start. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. All right, who is I? Who is Theophilus? What's the first book? We already have questions from the very first sentence, and that's normal. Uh, this is, tradition records, all the way back to the second century. This is about as old as it gets. Tradition records that this is written by a guy named Luke. Luke was a Gentile. Luke was a physician. And Luke became a follower of Jesus. And he recorded a biography of Jesus that we know as the book of Luke. That's the first book. This is a continuation. This is the second book. Think of it as a two-volume set. So what we're going to see is that in the first book, Luke has dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. What does that imply? That he's not done. <laughs> that he's still working. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Acts. Only he's going to be working in a different way. In the book of Luke... We see him, during his earthly ministry, acting in that way. 
in the book of Acts, we're going to see him working through the Holy Spirit through the church, through the lives of his followers, which has been going now for 2,000 years. In the first book, O Theophilus, who is Theophilus? Well, Theophilus means lover of God, and it was a very common name going back to the 3rd century B.C. So this is likely somebody that Luke knew, perhaps somebody who had underwritten the cost of capturing all this, all the research that was required for Luke to interview and, and gain the testimony from so many different eyewitnesses that he gathered. That is what went into Luke, and that is what went into Acts. In the first book, Luke says, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, we've talked a little bit about this in previous weeks. The apostles, apostle means sent one, one who is sent with a purpose, right? Many, many, many apostles. And so the apostles that we're most familiar with that we've been talking about lately, we've talked about John, we've talked about Peter, right? In the book of Acts, we're going to see those guys again, but we're going to see others that we haven't seen yet. Paul, Barnabas. Right? These were other apostles. So what Luke is saying at the very beginning is, I'm going to write this stuff down. I'm going to capture this. This is what has been happening up until the time he's taken up, after he gave commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. During the time period after the resurrection, before Jesus was taken up in the ascension, this was a time for instruction. This was a time for teaching. And Jesus is teaching and teaching and teaching and pouring into them and investing in them so that... They can then teach others. And this is when you begin to see the impact and the power of teaching in the church, even from its very, very earliest days. This is why teaching is so important, because we're doing what Jesus did. He presented himself, that's Jesus, alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. For 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus kept appearing to people. He kept appearing to the disciples. He kept appearing to crowds. One, Paul even records that he appeared at one point to a crowd of 500 people. This was not an isolated thing. This was not just a handful of people who said they saw Jesus. This was all over the place. And this is where Luke, as a physician, as a person of science, is saying, by many proofs, what he's saying is this is objective data. This is not just somebody you know, having a bad pizza and oh, I had a dream. I think I saw Jesus. Right? That's not what this is. This is objective. Appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What was Jesus' number one topic during his earthly ministry when he would teach? The kingdom of God. What is his number one topic during the 40 days after the resurrection? The kingdom of God. There's a consistency here. I hope you're picking up on it. The kingdom of God is the primary thing Jesus taught about. Number one. Second to nothing. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to, isn't that our favorite word? Wait. Just wait. Can I wait? But it's time to wait. What's Jesus telling them to do? I got stuff for you to do. I got a mission for you. I got a purpose. But right now, Wait, wait, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, this is John the baptizer, right? He baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You go all the way back to John the baptizer's ministry, what you find is that John predicted this. He said, there will be one who comes after me, will baptize you not with water, but with fire, the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus is saying here during this 40-day period is, it's time. But first, you have to wait. Don't miss that. So, when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? If I were Jesus, and let us all thank God that I'm not. If I were Jesus, this is the point where I think I would have shaken my head and said, if I had any hair left to yank out, like really, seriously? 
have you missed the entire point? What is the number one thing Jesus taught about in his earthly ministry? The kingdom of God. What is the number one thing Jesus talked about during the 40 days after the resurrection? The kingdom of God. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What are they asking about? This is a nationalistic question. What they're saying is, is now the time when Israel is going to be dominant and we're going to be in charge and tell everybody what to do? Because this is what they had been hoping for. This is what they've been waiting for. And they thought Jesus was going to be the one who was going to set that up and then they were going to get to rule alongside him and be telling everybody what to do. And everybody looks at them and, and Israel is like, we're in charge now because we're the chosen. What they did not understand and what Jesus told them again and again and again is that you are chosen, but you're chosen for a purpose. You're chosen for a mission. You're not chosen to be set up over people. You're chosen to love people. You're chosen to point people to their heavenly father. You're chosen for a purpose. Here, this question reveals that even at this point, after three years of walking with Jesus, after three years of hearing his teaching, after three years of all the miracles, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it time yet? Are we there yet? They're still missing it. And this is one of the struggle points. Because they wanted Jesus to do what they wanted him to do. When they wanted him to do it. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? You going to do it the way I want? You going to do it the way I want? You ready? Is it time yet? Maybe you've never ever felt like that. But I have. Jesus, is it time yet? Are you going to do that thing that I've been asking you to do for years now? Are you going to do it? 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 We can be as persistent as a two-year-old. Just like them. So before we look down our nose at them and say, oh, I can't believe they didn't get that. I don't get it either sometimes. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one in the room. Would someone please join me? Thank you. I appreciate that. So that I don't feel completely all by myself. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, none yet. It is none yet when that's going to happen. It is none yet when God is going to do what he's going to do. None yet. So leave it. Don't waste your time with idle speculation. Don't waste your time. People, by the way, keep forgetting this verse when we publish books like Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. And then when he doesn't, Why Jesus Will Really Return in 1989, which didn't sell nearly as well, strangely, as the first one. Please understand, this is why we don't set dates. Because Jesus said, it's not for you to know. Don't worry about that. I got something for you to worry about. I got something for you to do. I got something for you to focus on. It's not this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is a very famous verse. If you've been in church, you've heard this verse probably many times. You will receive power power dunamis in greek right this is this is dynamic this is where we get the word dynamic you will receive dynamic you will receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you where does the dynamic power come from holy spirit and you will be my witnesses we're going to come back to that word in just a minute but don't lose it you will be my witnesses in jerusalem and in all Judea, where is, is Jerusalem and Judea? Like, what's the correlation there? What's the relationship, you know? Jerusalem is in Judea. Judea is the region. Jerusalem is a city, right? So start there, then the region, Judea. Then Samaria, a neighboring region. Then to the end of the earth. It's scoping out. You're, like, widening the lens. 
Now, one thing, if you've been in church, you probably would remember is that Samaria was not a place that many people who were listening to Jesus at this point wanted to go. Because who lived in Samaria? Samaritans. And the Jewish people did not like the Samaritans. There was blood feud there. It was not good. A lot of, lot of baggage there. And a lot of racism there. And Jesus tells them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea. And, and I got, you got to understand that the people who are hearing this for the first time are hearing that. And you're like, where? I don't want to go there. Jerusalem. Now I'm good there. I know people there. I'm comfortable there. And what we're going to find as we go through the book of Acts is they would never have left there if the circumstances and the situations had not demanded it. Do you know what forced them to do what Jesus said? Persecution. That's what forced them out of Jerusalem. They would never have left. Why? Because it's comfortable. It's people like me. People who think like me and vote like me and act like me and talk like me. It's comfortable there. I don't want to there. The ends of the earth. You know who lives in the ends of the earth. Gentiles. I don't want any of that. We don't want any of that in our group. We're going to see all of that in the book of Acts. Jesus is laying the groundwork right here for everything we're going to see. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. A cloud, if, if you remember our study of Exodus last year, you remember that the cloud motif is, is very, very familiar, right? When God appears, he will appear and lead the people of Israel in... Uh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This cloud would come to be known as a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. And so what you see here is he is lifted up in a cloud. The Shekinah glory of God takes him out of their sight. This is what's going on here at what we call the ascension of Jesus. And they will see Jesus no more physically. While they're gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Which is a great question. What are y'all looking at? Because they're still standing there. Jesus has gone. And they're still standing there. uncomfortable yet yeah so like they're still standing there and these two guys are like what are you what are you what are y'all looking at why are you still standing there this jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven this this is a confirmation or a certain statement a promise of what we call the second coming when Jesus will return. And that's where I want to stop today. I want to stop at verse 11. Because I want to, I want to, I want to focus on a couple of points. And again, we're going, to, we're going to let the rock bounce across the top of the water here and dive a little bit on each one. The first thing I want to talk about is the word witnesses. The word witnesses comes from a Greek word, martyrus. And martyrus, can you see another word that we get in English from the word martyrus? Martyr. It's the same word. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my... A witness is loyal no matter the cost no matter the cost, and must be prepared to be a martyr, up to and including their life. Now, sometimes you don't have to, to be a martyr with your life. Sometimes you're just a martyr with other things. Sometimes you're a martyr with relationships. Sometimes you're a martyr 
with stuff, with resources, with money. Sometimes you're a martyr with the things that God puts into your life or into your hands, your, your career. A witness is loyal no matter the cost. Am I going to do what Jesus said no matter what? This is, this is one piece, and we could spend a whole week just on this. What does it mean to be a maturas for Jesus? Where you are. What does that mean? What does it mean to lay everything on the altar and say, I will sacrifice whatever, however, whenever to do what you said? Because you matter more than anything else. I'm willing to sacrifice anything for you. This is what Jesus is asking of them. And that hasn't changed. That is what Jesus asks of everyone who would choose to follow him. Will you put everything on the altar? Are you willing to sacrifice no matter the cost? To be the martyros, the witness. Are you prepared for that? That's, that's the first thing I don't want you to miss as we, as we open this series, as we look at this, because you're going to see men and women who struggle with this. And you're going to see men and women who, who made a choice to say yes to Jesus in this. And it will cost them sometimes their livelihood, sometimes their lives. That was the church. That is the church. There are more people killed for their faith in Jesus today in our world than there ever has been. This year, more people will lose their lives because of their faith in Jesus than any other year since Jesus walked the earth. This is not a, just an old back then, one day in the past. This is a present reality for many brothers and sisters in our world. And just because it's not our present reality in our circumstances in our situation today, I don't want you to be unaware of it. That's one thing I don't want you to miss. Another thing is this, the certainty of the second coming of Jesus. I mean, these two messengers from God, what we would call angelos or angels, right? These two messengers were pretty clear about that. Why are you standing here looking? Didn't he give you something to do this time? Like, he's going to come back the same way you saw him leave. But the thing I really want to zero in on is a phrase. And it's a phrase that Jesus was teaching the disciples and he referred to the promise of the Father. I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? Remember what he said? Wait for the promise of the Father, which you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Holy Spirit is one of those things, one of those one of those topics that we either talk so much about that it's all we talk about, or we don't talk about it at all. And, and I've seen this in church world now for the last 26 years. We, we go one way or the other. And, and some of you have been a part of churches that are, that are all about the word, all about the scripture, and very scripture-based. And there's almost no mention of the Holy Spirit at all unless it's in the scripture, and then you just kind of gloss by, yep, the Holy Spirit, yep, and you keep going. Or, some of you have been a part of a church where it's all about the Holy Spirit and we don't really worry so much about the Scripture because we're all focused on the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit going to do? How do you feel? How does your heart pound? And it's, it's very emotion-driven, not word-driven. And my point is that a fully functioning biblical church, I believe, incorporates the Holy Spirit and the Word. And it can't be either or. And you may be more comfortable in one, in one arena than the other but understand that both are important. And this is where I want to spend some time today. Because I think the Holy Spirit is one of the most misunderstood things in all the scriptures. I think we, we either shy away from it because we're nervous. Because quite frankly, every time you see the Holy Spirit in scripture, it's almost always unpredictable. Well, we like predictable. We like predictable. We like controlled planned, organized, sustainable. That's what we like. I like that. When we're planning a service, we plan it down to the minute. Why? 
because we like planned, organized, controlled. You know what the Holy Spirit is? Not controlled. <laughs> Can't control the Holy Spirit. Can't do it. And that makes us a little bit nervous, those of us who like planning. So what do we do? Well, we tend not to talk about the Holy Spirit very much. We talk about Jesus. We're not going to talk about the Holy Spirit so much. But the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. And Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And to ignore the Holy Spirit is to miss a very, very important person. This is what we're going to spend some time on as we walk through Acts together. What, what is the purpose of this Holy Spirit? What is the purpose of this promise that Jesus made, the promise of the Father? Well, the Holy Spirit we see in the book of Acts will regenerate, will fill, will encourage, will direct, and will give boldness to Jesus' followers so that we can do what Jesus commands. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do what Jesus told us to do. You cannot do what Jesus told us to do apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. can't do it. Try to do it in your own strength, your own power. You will fail. This is the function of the Holy Spirit in the lives of followers of Jesus. Whew. Well, that's a mouthful. How do I understand that? How do I wrap my arms around that? And so we've tried in, in many ways in church world to, to kind of hang some words on the Holy Spirit to make a little more sense to us. Anybody ever heard the Holy Spirit called the Comforter? Yeah, the Comforter. We like that. Right? Never mind the Comforter is what you, like, get up underneath when it's cold. Right? A Comforter might be what you have on your bed. You get a Comforter. Oh, it's warm, cozy, predictable, controllable. Any of that ring a bell? I like what I was reading this week <laughs> here from William Barclay. He said, we often call the Holy Spirit the comforter. And that word goes back to the great translator, John Wycliffe, but in his day, it had a different meaning. It wasn't what we think of. The one who comforts, who wraps his arms around like a big warm blanket. No, 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 no. In Wycliffe's day, it came from the Latin word fortis, which means brave. The comforter is the one who fills people with courage and with strength. That's what a comforter does. Think about fortified. A fortified wall is one that's hard to break through. It's a strong wall. That's the root. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The one who gives us courage and boldness and strength. Ooh, that's a different picture. And that is exactly what we're going to see in the book of Acts. Again and again and again. So the Holy Spirit makes us brave. Brave to do what exactly? What is it exactly that Jesus is calling us to do? Well, we've read a little bit in Acts 1.8, but don't miss this from Matthew 28. Jesus teaches we're to be his witnesses, making disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he's commanded us. Anybody know what that's called? The Great Commission of Jesus. This is the commissioning with which he commissions his followers, his disciples. We're to be witnesses, making disciples of all nations as we are sharing baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything he's commanded us. This is what our work is to be. Seems pretty clear. Any confusion so far? Well, there's actually a lot of confusion about this. And particularly in our day. And particularly in our culture. And here's why. To a society that denies absolute truth and therefore shuns apologetics and persuasion and evangelism, apologetics is learning how to defend what you believe, understanding why you believe what you believe. To a society that denies absolute truth and shuns apologetics and persuasion and evangelism in favor of dialogue, Acts presents a church that persuaded people until they were convinced of the truth of the gospel. It's not just a dialogue. 
there's actually a goal in mind. The goal in mind of the people of the book of Acts is to persuade people to become followers of Jesus. Instead of aiming at mutual enrichments as the main aim of interreligious encounters today, the early church proclaimed Christ as supreme Lord with conversion in view. Age of Fernando wrote those words, and as I read them, I thought, wow, that is so true. In our day, it's, it's about dialogue. It's about sharing beliefs, and you know, yours is okay, and mine is okay, and everybody's okay. Understand, before we go any farther into the book of Acts, and this is going to be so important as we walk through it, the great commission of Jesus runs directly counter to religious pluralism. This belief that no ideology can claim to possess absolute truth, that all religions are more or less equal. The great commission of Jesus runs exactly counter to that. You cannot say you want to follow Jesus and do what he said and believe in religious pluralism. Because they're diametrically opposed. Religious pluralism teaches that you should never attempt to convert other people to your side out of a belief that you possess absolute truth. Does this sound like what Jesus said? Not even a little bit. Here's my question. And I don't want you to take my word for this. The question that I ask you is one that I've asked you regularly and frequently during my entire tenure here. What does Scripture say? This is the question. It's not what I think. What, 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 whatever I think or whatever I feel, whatever you think or whatever you feel, those things can change. That's the question. What does God's Word say? What does Scripture say about this? Well, Jesus teaches that we're to be His witnesses. Making disciples, that is, making people who follow him of all nations no exceptions even gentiles baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit when do you baptize somebody after they make a choice to follow jesus you can't baptize them unless they make a decision to follow jesus so we make disciples we baptize them and then we teach them to obey all that he has commanded us this is what it looks like to help other people take their next step toward their Heavenly Father. Now, everybody who is listening to Jesus when he first says these things, this is different. This is different. Because they really were not into this in their culture. You did not have an active evangelism ministry among first century Judaism. Could you convert? Could you become a part of it? Yeah, if you want to. Sure. we got a process. But that wasn't really their goal. This is different. This is actively seeking to reach out to and connect with people and bring them in so that they will become followers of Jesus like we are. Ooh. What I don't want you to miss even here in the book of Acts so far, is that God is doing something new then and now. For some of you, Southview is new, and, and you're, you're new to this environment, you're new to our church, and like Jenna said earlier, we're really glad that you're here. And I want you to understand as we walk through Acts a little bit about who we are. Southview was started in 1978 to be a dynamic, and this is a quote from the church's charter, the original founding document. Stuff you started to be a dynamic, where do you think that word came from? And you will receive power, dynamos. A dynamic spiritual organism, empowered by the Holy Spirit, where did that come from? This is all acts. This is all acts. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, to share Christ with as many people as possible. That was day one. Day one. That's our mission. That is our purpose. We've shortened that and tried to make it a little more portable. And so today we say it like this. We exist so that people who are far from God will be raised to new life in Jesus. That's why we're here. That's what we're about. That is the center of the bullseye for us. Everything we do, we look at through that lens. 
And for some people, that's a really hard thing because we live in a pluralistic age. But there's so many different ideas and they're all good ideas, they're all equal and there's not one better than another, there's no absolute truth. And all these are things that we hear, all these are things that are taught, all these are things that are said. So why are we still proclaiming Christ in this pluralistic age? What makes Christianity unique? Why is it different than all the others? A simple answer to that is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is what makes Christianity different than everything else. There is no other faith. There is no other belief system like Christianity. It is unique. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty clear to me. And this is what we teach. There is no other way. Why do we teach this? Why are we still talking about this now, even in this day, even in this age, even in this area, which is so resistant and so antagonistic often to faith claims like what Jesus said? Why are we still doing this? Because only in him can we find peace. That's why. Anybody want peace? Anybody need peace? Anybody crave it? It's only in him. And those of us who have chosen to follow him realize that, and we want to share that with as many people as possible so they too will find it. Only in him do we find peace. Only in him do we find hope. Hope that this relationship with God that has been severed by our sin, our, our choices, our decisions, to turn away from our Heavenly Father, only in Him do we have hope that that, re that that relationship is restored. That's the promise. That's the hope that we have. And only in Him do we find life with God, now and forever. Only in Him. People who say, Jesus was a good teacher. I'll just accept him as a good teacher. Okay, well, he said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father through him. That doesn't sound like a good teacher to me if it's not true. If that's true, then he is what he said he is. Here's what I want to ask you. Here's what I want to challenge you with. Do not be afraid to follow what Scripture says. Everything in our culture presses against you, just like it pressed on the disciples in the first century. Everything in our culture presses against you to be afraid. Well, I can't, I can't really be public about this. I can't really talk about this. Don't be afraid to do what Jesus says to do. You will be my witnesses, my martyros. You will be my witnesses. That means we're not shy about it. Jesus promised, I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. So my challenge to you this week, as we, as we tie a bow on this first section of Acts, just this first section, and it gets way more challenging from here, let's choose to be the church every day not just on Sunday. Because that's what we're going to see in the book of Acts. We're going to see in the book of Acts people who were not just the church on the day that they gathered and worshipped. <coughs> we're going to see people who were the church every day. That's what it means to follow in the example of the early church. We're going to be the church every day. Let's be followers and let's be witnesses of the way every day. That's what they called Christianity at first. They called it the way. Where do you think they got that? Jesus said, I am the way. We're followers of the way. We're followers of Jesus. Let's be followers and witnesses of the way every day, not just on Sunday, not just when we gather together. Let's see the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and through us every day. This is what they saw. This is what they experienced. And as I read Scripture, Scripture says that God doesn't change, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
So if they experience the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit at work in them and through them every day, you know what that means? So can you. So can I. Let's do what Jesus said every day. Not just when it's comfortable, not just when we're with people like us, but when we're not. This is my challenge for us as we start this book. This is going to be a challenging study. And I've heard from so many of you who, when I first mentioned that I was going to be teaching through this, you're like, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait. I hope you feel like that three weeks in. Because <laughs> this is a challenging study. But here's what, I, here's what I know to be sure. What is given to us in Scripture is given to us for our edification so that we can learn, so that we can grow so that we benefit from it. This is what I know. And I know that as we learn from this, just like as we've learned through so many other books, as we walk through this together, as we learn from this, we're going to be face to face with a choice. Either do what Jesus said every day, or don't. And you get to choose. And I get to choose. Either do what Jesus said every day, or don't. I'm going to be challenging you every week. Take another step. Take another step toward Jesus. Take another step toward the way. Because there's only one. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I know this is a challenging teaching for so many because we've heard and been taught and maybe we've even said something different. But the book of Acts is built on this foundation, this foundation of what Jesus said, what he taught, who he was, who he is, the way, the truth, and the life. And the early church believed that no one comes to you except through him. And we believe that too. Not because William says it, but because scripture says it, because you have said it in your word. That has implications for everything in our lives. My prayer as we start this study is we would allow this to be the foundational piece. That as we read the words that Luke committed to paper so long ago, that we would come to your word with open hearts, with open ears, to listen to what you have to say to us, to each one of us. And wherever we are in our spiritual journey, you love us, but you... You love us too much to leave us there. You want us to take our next step. And every one of us has a next step. It's easy to be fearful. It's easy to, to be afraid and, and kind of shy away from what we've talked about today. Kind of shy away from the truth that Jesus is the only way. But that is core to our faith. We cannot be a follower of Jesus and not believe that. May we understand that. And may we each take our next step with you from where we are. This is what I pray in the name of Jesus for each one. Amen. Thanks so much for coming today. We'll see you all next week. Have a great Mother's Day.